Good evening, and welcome to the New York Television Festival. I'm Terrence Gray, the Executive Director. Thank you. <laughs> welcome to our creative keynote conversation. This is NYTBF's fourth annual keynote event, and as always, it would not be possible without the tremendous help of CAA, led by NYTBF board member Adam Berkowitz. Tonight, I am thrilled to welcome a true storytelling visionary to the stage. His early writing credits run the gauntlet from the 1980s Nickelodeon series, Hey Dude, to Phil House, to penning, to penning the screenplay of a little film called Speed. Most recently, he wrote two installments of the award-winning miniseries Band of Brothers, won Emmys and Golden Globes as the producer of the HBO miniseries From the Earth to the Moon, as a writer, director, and co-executive producer for the epic HBO miniseries, The Pacific. He's created two critically lauded series for NBC, Boomtown and Reigns, and of course, many of you know him as the showrunner and executive producer of the acclaimed FX series, Justified. That's right. <laughs> His new spy drama, The Americans, will debut on FX early next year. It is an honor to welcome to our stage NYTBF's creative keynote speaker, writer, director, producer, Graham Yost. And your moderator for this evening has written for TV, uh, for New York Magazine, G uh, GQ, TV Guide, and Entertainment Weekly. Please welcome good friend of the festival, John Sellers. Is there a moderator for this debate? <laughs> uh, politics. We will not be getting into that, um, though you... You're Canadian. Do you get to vote here? I am an American citizen now. All right. Plus. Um, yeah. So I am really lucky. I've done two of these. My first one was with Mitch Hurwitz of Arrested Development. Wow. And number two is Graham Yost, so I'm batting 1,000. Um, but I don't want to put any pressure on you. He was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Oh, it's one of my favorite shows. Yes. Um, you were telling me something in the back that oh, yeah. I think is really important to reveal. Uh, Arrested Development fans out there? Any at all? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, you know that they're doing 13, I think, for Netflix. And uh, their writer's offices for Justified um, are in the Culver Studios. And someone noticed one day, I don't know if they're headquartered there, but they looked down, and there was the Bluth stair car. And for $5, I'll show you the picture of me in front of the stair car after. $5? Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm in New York. That's yeah. kind of a bargain. Um, so I want to talk about your entire career in 45 minutes. Um, but I'd like to start with Justified, because I just went through a marathon of season three, which for some reason I didn't watch when I was airing. However, I just watched it, and it is amazing. Um, and I'm, you know, it's on the brain. Um, most, my most important question is Dickie. <laughs> what's going to happen with Dickie? Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with Dickie, nor do we know what's going to happen with Dickie's hair. Um, <laughs> in season three, Jeremy showed up and that was his haircut. He had cut it himself and it was like, okay, let's, let's go with that. Um, you know, we'll see Dickie, story-wise, is in prison now, and uh, we may see him. Um, the feeling with, with Dickie is you, you want to give, you know, you want it to be a, a big arc. You want it to be a, a real chunk. Or it could be one episode, but not just a couple. Um, you know, the other favorite character for us in the writer's room is uh, Dewey Crow, played by Damon Harriman. And we love, yeah, we love to have... Damon come by, you know, once a season at least or a couple times. And we, we haven't actually landed on anything this year, and we don't want to force it. Um, but we'll see. How does that, how does that work with, with, you know, Damon, for instance? Well, Damon's Australian, so he, uh, he comes out for a chunk of time every year, gets a visa, and just is available to work. And mm -hmm. he's usually not that, not that hard to get, although, I mean, he has been working a lot. He, he did, uh, I think he did a couple Wilfreds, and uh, he was in J. Edgar. And anyway, 
he does work a lot, but oh, he's and he's just the greatest guy. He he. Rem when we were doing the pilot, we were shooting in Pittsburgh, and he's covered with white supremacist tattoos. And the makeup people said it'd be really great if you didn't take them off in the weekend, you know, because they. <laughs> They take a couple hours to put on, and so there he is walking around Pittsburgh with swastikas on his neck and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, no, it really, and he's Australian. You know, my, it's not me. This is, a, it's a part. Anyway. Right. Um, I'm not going to diss Pittsburgh. No. It no. like a great place. No, we love, we love being in Pittsburgh. Um, it's great. Now, when you're, when you're writing things for somebody, you know, you said that uh, you're going to have some guest stars on this season. Do you specifically write something with them in mind? Or, or like, were you a fan of this guy that we're going to talk about in a second, Patton Oswald? Were you a fan going into it, or did you just meet him for the first time? Um, no, I mean, I've, I've been a fan for a, a number of years. Um, I love his stand-up, and uh, I can do a really bad version of his KFC uh, bowl joke, <laughs> which is just one of the, my favorite things of all time. But he... Um, we found out last year that he was a fan of the show. And so we started thinking, is there any place for Patton? And it's one of those things where, you know, you try and sort of not wedge him in, but okay, we've got a part, he could play that. And I've learned enough um, faith over the, the course of Justified, at least, because um, I've never been involved with a show that's gone more, you know, this number of years. So, but where um, something doesn't work out, but then the next go round, you come up with something. Oh, that that's perfect for him, and his schedule permits. So, there's yeah, there's a new character that he he's gonna uh, be playing, and they're actually shooting right now. Um, and I th he's having a lot of fun. What's the character? I'm not gonna tell you that. <laughs> no, I, the character is Constable Bob. I don't know if, you know if we ever came up with a last name for him. There's this weird thing in Kentucky where they have uh, each county has a constable, mm -hmm. one or two constables, and it's an elected position, but your salary is like. Two thousand dollars a year. You've got to pay for your own car, your own light bar, your own uniform. But what they get to do with that is serve papers, and they can charge. What is it? They charge sixty dollars for serving papers, whereas the state police has to charge eighty. So they undercut the state police, and that's how they make money. And so we just like the idea of this sort of cop wannabe, who's kind of a cop, interacting right. with Raylan. So. <laughs> Um, and it, you said it was uh, just one episode now, but it could turn into something possibly larger. Is he um, part more? You know, depending upon his availability and how the stories start right. to arc out. I mean, we're, as I said, we started shooting, um, well, it's two weeks ago, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got four written a couple more broken, but we're not entirely sure where we're going. We've got rough targets. Um, but then you start to, oh boy, it'd be fun to have Constable Bob back. Okay, this would be a fun scene, so. So you, you don't, you're not one of those people that maps out the entire season uh, like a puzzle uh, first um, before you do it. You, you work on it as it, as it happens, or um, do you change it up every season? You know, uh, when I go in, let, let's say, I, this year we started early, but let's say we, we start on a certain date, start the writer's room. Within that first three weeks or four weeks, I go into FX and I say, this is what the season is going to be. And then the season turns out to be nothing like what I just said. <laughs> um, no, they, usually the first chunk of episodes will be close to what I'm pitching, but then stuff just evolves in the room. Um, I'd like to say that um, we're following in the footsteps of our, of our great mentor and, and, and our guiding light, our North Star, Elmore Leonard, because uh, when he's writing, he doesn't know where he's going. Uh, he just sees where the, the, the story takes him, where the characters take him. And we, we don't quite have that amount of freedom because we've got to keep making the deadlines. But we try to, try to keep it fairly loose. Um, so how involved is he now? Um, I, I know that he wrote that book right. um, that came out last, last year. year. Does that mess you up at all, like that he writes these new plots that you know, you might not have conceived for... What no, only that, that Tim Oliphant falls in love with, like, every word, and we have to somehow get that into a scene. But um, <laughs> it was... Uh, no, it was, it was a great gift, in fact. And there was one chunk of that book that we're... Actually, uh, we've been breaking an episode, our sixth episode, and it'll be featured in that. I'm not going to tell which chunk. But we used a little bit in the second year. We used some last year. Um, and he basically said, you know, just hang it up and strip it for parts. 
Um, so we take a story, divide it into two, use this for one episode, use another chunk later on. Um, you know, he had enough experience in Hollywood where he, he makes no, you know, he has no interest in giving us notes or in being involved in that process. He likes to write. He likes to sit at home and write. And, um, and you know, come out and visit the set or get honored and we see each other with those kinds of things. And, um, <laughs> not necessarily where I'm being honored, but where he is. And that's, uh, it's, it's fantastic. So. Did, uh, when you first started doing it, were you just like, I can't, you know, this guy has a lot of fans. Uh, he has a very distinctive voice. Were you at all like apprehensive about adapting somebody so distinctive? You know, not, I, it's funny. I, n I never thought of that as any pressure because I'm a fan. I, I've been reading um, his stuff since La Brava, which was back in the mid '80s, and um, so I was really excited about taking a shot at it. Uh, I remember seeing, I guess, get get Shorty came first, and then Out of Sight. Those are the two Scott Frank a adaptations, and. You know, reading about it now, Scott had to do a lot of work to make them into movies, but when I came out of the movie theater, I remember thinking, well, he did a great job because he let Elmore be Elmore, and he just, because Elmore writes such fantastic dialogue. So now, we're not adapting anymore, except for these little bits from the book, um, so we've got to come up with our own stuff, and we really, you know, try and channel that. You know, what would Elmore do? How would it flow? How would it feel? Um, and, you know, you hope that you're not just mimicking and you know, hope that it's not just a pastiche after a while, that, that you are really still trying to honor the, the core of it. We're looking at maybe doing six years. I think that's the contract with Tim. Um, I think any more beyond that, we'd probably, then we would probably be doing sort of Elmore Light. And I'm, I'm sure <laughs> we do that now anyway. So, um, you know, any much, much more than that, we'd really run that risk. So, six seasons in a movie? <laughs> oh, of, of course, on any, on any television show. I'm sure you're always talking about that movie. Um, you have two actors working for you that I personally think have two of the greatest acting names ever, Tim Oliphant and Walter Goggins. Walton Goggins. Walton Goggins. Goggins? Goggins. These I are know. great names. It's a great name. Do you call um, Tim, Timothy? Um, the Elephant Man. The Elephant we Man. We never, we never refer to him as the Elephant Man. No, and uh, I can probably say pretty safely we never will. <laughs> okay. Um, it's just a. Now Tim is Tim is a great guy, yeah. and he's very easy to work with. He has a lot of notes. He's incredibly involved um, every step of the way. Um, and Walton is a joy, you know, in his own right. Walton gives smaller notes on his scenes, little restructurings, little tweaks on lines, little ideas for character shifts and surprises, um, but we feel really blessed by the cast that we have. Do you, do you um, like when the actors tell you or give their opinions, or is it more like the writer's room is sacred, don't? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because Justified really isn't, is, although I'm the showrunner, it really isn't my show. I, I have no authorial claim. Boomtown was more my show in that it wasn't based on anything. It was an idea I had, a structure, the characters, everything. Um, and, and still it became a group, and it really was a group effort. All the writers, all the cast, the directors, and everyone involved. But with Justified, it's, you know, I mentioned, talk about Elmore, we could talk about Elmore all night long. But really, and it's not entirely his show either, but at least we're all pulling in that direction. It's let's, let's try and go towards him. So everyone has, to a degree, an equal say in how we get there. And Tim has read all the books now. He was actually not that familiar with Elmore when we started the pilot, but he got hooked. And so he'll say, well, you know, it's like he's quoting from scripture. And in Tishomingo Blues, it says, you know, um, so he, um, he, he has a lot of input. And, uh, it, you know, I don't agree with everything he comes up with and sometimes will tussle. But a lot of it is really, really smart. Um, so I, anyway, long, long answer to saying no. It, they don't come into the room, but the actors are very much involved in the process. Do you like it or do you not like it when people that you 
hired to write for the show or um, have worked with go on and create something amazing? Um, <laughs> Like, would, do you do you want them to leave yeah. and create their own? That is like, or the, do you want to keep them? It and felt them? like we were going along at this level, and then suddenly you went yeah. right down deep into my psyche. And the fact that someone warned you that I'm a very small, petty man. <laughs> How did you know? Um, no, I I hate it when people I like have success. <laughs> no, yeah. I, honestly, the 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 only uh, the only the only downside is if um, you know they're working on the show, and then it means we might lose them. Um, right. T Taylor Elmore, who is um, a writer I met on Reigns, and we couldn't get him for the first season of Justified because he was still on Cold Case. And we got him in the second season. Um, and he's just a fantastic writer. And he's got this pilot script at, at Fox um, that they came very close to shooting last year. And they rolled it over into this year. And then they asked me to, it, the new term, be a godfather. I hadn't heard this until <laughs> like five weeks ago. Um, and I'm just sort of backing it up. But, but Taylor is just a brilliant writer. And I hope the series goes. I hope the pilot goes. And I hope it goes to series. It, it, except for the fact that it would be, you know, awful to lose him from the justified lineup. Um, so to a degree, I hope we all just sort of stick together for the next three years, and then everyone, you know, explodes and has. And I listen. I hope they have big success because mm -hmm. I'll need a job in five years. <laughs> you know? I mean, you could sabotage the pilot if you're the Godfather. That's true. <laughs> yes, torpedo that's that. True. Um, so, you know, it's, it's always interesting to me to talk to uh, people about how they became, you know, got to where they are, and, you know, I was looking at your credits, and I saw that you started off at, as a writer at Nickelodeon, um, that was one of your, your first, uh, first places, and the show Turkey TV, which I don't know if anyone remembers, I, it was a one season wonder, I think, um, it's very funny. But did you, like, it's so I, I don't different think, I don't from what I you're ever, doing. I don't think I ever saw it, actually. <laughs> right. Um, what happened was, uh, I'll try and shorten the story, but a friend of mine was working at Doubleday. He was playing on the softball team. I went out to watch him play. There was a very cute girl there. I flirted with her. We went on a couple dates. Then I found out she was living with a guy. Hmm. So, but then I met the guy, and he and I became friends, and he was an editor working at Nickelodeon on Turkey TV, and I got a job, so it all worked out. <laughs> That's amazing. It was great. Um, I actually, I, I had dinner with him uh, in the spring when I was down for uh, another thing. But um, so we were just writing jokes. But I was teamed up with Adam Bernstein, who then went on to become this great TV director. Directed the pilot for Scrubs. Directed a bunch of Oz. And he's a New York guy. So anytime I have, if I'm working on a show, I always see if Adam can come do an episode. But usually it doesn't work out because he's just busy in New York. But um, so he was like the person you you wrote the. We would Turkey just write, TV. yeah. We would just write gags, and a lot of it right. was using um, sort of uh, public domain um, film footage of like old commercials and industrial films, and we would have to write gags based on that. And then we had two guys sitting on a porch making jokes. I don't know. I, I can't remember much about it except I got paid to go in an office and eat a sandwich and make jokes. And it was just so much fun. And Adam's just a fantastic guy. So. Was that your very first writing job before Hey Dude? That was before. Uh, hey very first. I guess it's my first paid scripting, scripted job. But before that, but before you that. Uh, wrote for some various and sundries. Yes, as I said too early, I wrote everything but porn. Um, <laughs> right. No one wants Canadian porn. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the maple syrup is sticky. The, you know. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I, I just killed the whole line of inquiry. No, no, no. Um, you, you wrote for the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yes. Um, which just died um, recently. I don't know Thanks if you've Thanks for heard that. reminding me, making me. Yeah, it was. Do you I, remember I, came, which I came to, I came to New York uh, 30 years ago, and it's like, holy right. shit. Really, when I sit up here, I, it feels like I've gone from a uh, young, aspiring, you know, whatever to a wily old vet in about <laughs> a minute. Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, Britannica, it started off, it was working on an encyclopedia that was an offshoot of theirs that mm -hmm. they were doing with an Italian graphics company. And we were just in this little office on just like west of 10th Avenue in the 20s somewhere and um, writing these short little pieces. And then the managing editor quit to go off 
to something else. So I became the managing editor, and it was crazy. And um, but you know, I wrote things on hovercraft, heat <laughs> treatment, you know, uh, all these weird things. And uh, the 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 one thing I remember from it, besides friends I made on it, was that the the, the editor-in-chief of the project, the person they hired to oversee all the editorial and had to sign off on every article, was Charles Van Doren of the Quiz Show scandal wow. from the 50s. Um, and uh, yeah, and then later on, completely unrelated, my girlfriend had gone to school with his daughter and I got to know her. It was like suddenly I was all Van Doren all the time. But anyway, um, that, was, that was an early job. I wrote for Soap Opera Digest. I wrote. Um, a pamphlet for home care of people with catheters sticking out of their chest, I swear <laughs> to God. Um, I wrote on vitamins and minerals and back pain. I ghost, uh, co-wrote a book on childhood fears. Ghost wrote a book with Isidore Rosenfeld, who became a big New York um, all right. medical personality. Um, so, and, th and then yeah. all of that stuff. But, all I, but I always wanted to write um, scripted. I always wanted to write for movies or TV. Um, that's, I mean, it's fascinating that, it, it, did, did you ever take like a, a screenwriting course during that time or were you just writing scripts well, on no, your, I mean, your I, own? Well, no, I mean, I came to New York because I was not accepted to Columbia. So <laughs> I was like, fuck you. And right. so I took um, an NYU summer course called Sight and Sound. <laughs> and six weeks, we made six short movies and uh, the friends I was staying with said, hey, you might as well stay. And I said, okay, so I stayed. And, um, but that, you know, I took a writing course. I went to the University of Toronto, took a writing course there. I didn't really learn from that. What I learned about writing, I learned from writing. And I started writing screenplays years before even that. I started writing them when I was in my late teens, and they were all terrible, terrible, <laughs> terrible. But then when I moved to New York, they, there was one idea I had um, that was about reporters at a uh, sort of weekly world news kind of newspaper. And I wrote a draft. And it wasn't great, but it wasn't terrible. And I decided to do another draft. And I did about five drafts of that script, and I learned a lot just doing draft after draft. What did you, um, like, what did you take away from it? You know, it was just that it can always be better. You know, I, I think that before that, I'd write a script that didn't work. I'd go on to the next one, which is, by the way, an important skill to have, because sometimes you do need to just abandon it and go on to the next one. But um, the ability, if, if you recognize that something's good, to really you know, really stick with it and go at it. Um, I mean, jumping forward, when I had some time to kill and I, I decided to write Speed, um, I knew that that was something that could work. And so I really, I worked very hard at it and did a bunch of outlines and showed them to friends and got a lot of important advice from friends, like it should be 50 miles an hour, not 20. And, uh, <laughs> I had a really good rationale for why it was 20, but I'm not going to share that with you now. Was, so was it called, uh, I mean, because speed indicates... Okay, uh, the original like, title, oh God. <laughs> the original title was Minimum Speed. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, okay, oh, it's easy for you. Now, you know, you don't want the word minimum in a title. Right. Yeah. Maximum slowness. Maximum. Well, frankly, when they did Speed 2 and the tagline was cruise control, it's like, well, well cruise control is when you want, don't want to pay attention. Right. Cruise control is when you want to listen to the radio. Oh, God. Um, so where were you when you came up with uh, Pop Quiz Hot Shot? Uh, that, that's Joss Whedon's line. Mine was uh, not oh. nearly as clever as that. Joss did a total dialogue rewrite on that script, and... Uh, um, you know, I'll be forever grateful because it was a weird, th I'd written all the drafts up to a point, they brought in another writer, and it was one of the dark nights of the soul when I read his draft, and it wasn't Joss, great writer, shall go nameless, <laughs> but it was horrible, and it was like, oh my God, what have they done to my child? <laughs> and um, then they brought me back on for a, a, a short period, and then brought Joss in to work uh, into production and to get it into shooting shape. And when I read his draft, I went, oh, thank God. Oh, he gets it. Um, you know, he's a very funny writer, very smart writer. And so I was very, very lucky. 
But anyway, Pop Goes Hot Shot. No, I mean, but structurally, all that was in there, the idea of these guys always quizzing each other. I just didn't have that smart-ass phrase. Right. Was it Pop Quiz, like, dude, before? <laughs> uh, I don't think it was. No. Yeah. All right. Um, now, when you, uh, you know, we'll move forward a little bit, because we're talking about speed. You wrote two other movies, or two other movies that you wrote were produced in the 90s, and both um, starred Christian Slater. Did you, were you like, can we get somebody else, like for the third, like the next movie you did, or, hey, I like Christian Slater, I'm not, but, I mean, you was know, it just I, like, Listen, I, I, have, with the Christian I, have Slater. No, I have nothing to do with casting. I mean, the closest I had anything to do with casting was when we were casting Speed and we went to everyone. And then someone's kid at Fox, some, someone at Fox, their kid said, what about Keanu Reeves? Hmm. And, they went, oh. and so we met with him, and I'd never met him before, first of all, half Canadian, so that's important. And he's six foot one, and he's a tall, strapping, you know, strapping young guy, and he already had the short, cool haircut, and he drove up in a motorcycle, and we looked at each other and said, well, yeah, he can act well enough, but he looks great. <laughs> um, and that was, that was really my only sort of involvement, really, in casting. And when it came to, uh, you know, I'm a writer. In, t in television, it's a whole different deal. But, um, you know, with the, the casting of Broken Arrow, it was just, I mean, I went and I spent half an hour with Johnny Depp trying to convince him to do it instead of doing Nick of Time. <laughs> and Nick of Time, I understand, is a very bad movie. I've never seen it, but I understand it's a very bad movie. I cannot honestly tell you that Broken Arrow is a good movie, so I don't know if he made the bad, uh, wrong choice, but um, you know, I gave it my best shot to talk. You know, and he's just this punk from 90210. What, I mean, or no, uh, Jump Street. And it's like, oh my god, I've got to talk to this teen heartthrob. Uh -huh. Little did I know. I don't, little did he know. Yeah. Um, so, let's go back to um, pre-speed. You then moved to LA after you worked out here um, to work on, you went to work on Nickelodeon out there? Well, well I mean, what happened was, uh, from Turkey TV, uh, they liked my stuff, they had some money kicking around. I wrote a pilot, or Ber I wrote a pilot with Adam Bernstein consulting on it, because he would direct it, called The Monster Hunters League, about kids in suburbia who hunt monsters. Still a good idea, wow. but people have done that kind of stuff since. Yeah. Anyway, but um, it didn't sell, but they liked it, and so they had this show coming along called Hey Dude, and they needed writers, and so I got a job on Hey Dude, and Nickelodeon had no idea what they were doing. Nobody had any idea what they were doing. It was, you know, Nickelodeon's based in New York at that time, and a uh, production company out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and we're shooting in Tucson, and I was living in L.A. I mean, it was just crazy, and we were shooting these episodes for a... Yeah, $100,000 for a half hour. I mean, just very, very little money by television standards. And uh, that was a great experience. And we did 65 episodes in two years. And um, you know, I wrote like 13 of them or 15 of them or something like that. Yeah, I mean, that must have been like a the best learning experience in a it way. It was like, fantastic. Yeah. It was a great learning. Because it was, you know, you write it one day and the next day you're on the set and you're seeing them shoot it. Man. Um, it was, that was really fun. It was a great group of people. Um, what did you learn most there? I mean, did, did you just like you have to, you have to show up and you have to do it? Or yeah, you yeah. just have to do it, and yeah. and just I don't know. I, it, it was just yeah the process of doing it, um, finding out what works and what doesn't work. Sometimes from a directorial standpoint, it'd be like no, you, you shouldn't have shot it that way because you blew the joke, hmm. you know. So you have to write a little more carefully to make sure that if it's a visual gag, it's going to get sold. Um, then when that was over, you, you... That's when I went right into Speed. Um, right. And then before Speed sold, you, that's the next question. Yeah, the Full House. Full House, man. Were you on any other My sitcoms, era or was that full just house. you? Well, no. I, I went from Speed, I wrote uh, a couple of uh, half-hour specs. I wrote a Murphy Brown right. and a Roseanne, <laughs> and I uh, had a friend who was an agent. She said, I can get you work, but... They don't staff until May, so I wrote Speed in the interim. I got on Full House. They hired me for my Edge. <laughs> Turns out they didn't need Edge. Right. It was a miserable experience. Great people, but a miserable experience. Um, while I was there, uh, th th I was hired on a 10-week probationary period. And this, this, uh, the self-aggrandizing story. 
Um, I quit after nine and a half weeks. And uh, I quit four days before I knew they were going to fire me. And then two days later, Speed sold. Um, I mean, so. Um, but the, uh, we were on the set one day, and Dennis Rinsler, who was one of the showrunners, said it was, the, uh, it was the Olsen twins' fifth birthday. And he said, don't look them in the eye. <laughs> don't look them in the eye. And I was doing something like this in L.A. a couple of years ago, and Dennis showed up, and I said, i got to ask you. You, and he said, oh, I'm just fucking with you. you know? <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, the new writers, we'd say something like that. Uh, so quitting versus being fired, what, what, what do you recommend if you're, you're, if you're starting oh, out? You know, by, well, no, actually. I mean, it's, uh, I've had friends in similar, not similar, but situations where it wasn't good, and they just said, fire me. And they said, well, we're not going to fire you. We'd like you to quit. Well, I'm not quitting because if, I, if you fire me, I still get paid. <laughs> if I quit, I don't get paid. So I'll stick it out, and you guys can be assholes to me, but you're paying me. And it's like, that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, yeah. you gotta pay, got to pay the mortgage, you know. So. Um, but for me, yeah. it was, yeah, I'm quitting. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then we were talking about this as well. Uh, you recently had... Uh, callback to that um, because you. Well, I, I, a friend yeah. and I wrote a rewrote a pilot called Dead Lawyers that didn't end up selling, but for a while John Stamos was attached to it, and of course he didn't rem remember me at all. But it was fun to meet him after all those years and hear some of the stories from you know what it was like doing that show and how crazy it was and working with Saget, who if you've ever heard his stand up is like right. the most foul mouthed blue comedian in the world. Um, and, uh, and Stamos, you know, he's one of those people who uh, you can't help but hate because he's just so good looking and he's really smart and really charming. And I was like, fuck, come on. Yeah, quit, quit making us all look bad. Yeah. Um, but do you, so did you look him in the eye? Yeah, I, I was able, and I asked him that story and he, yeah. he'd never heard that. He thought it was hilarious. Um, now, that is uh, another example of, you, know, you, you seem to be mentioned a lot in, in terms of you know, being attached to stuff. Um, he's attached to this, he's attached to this. Um, one, do, you know, do you like being attached to projects, seeing your name out there, but at what point do you, like you have a couple of shows um, coming out, like at what point do you get too maxed out in terms of work? Like when can't you write anymore? I think right now. I mean, no, <laughs> literally, I mean, doing Justified and and a, a couple other things going on is about the limit. Um, and, but the, the things I've become attached to, um, and it's just, it's, it's just the way the business works, that you know, somehow my name or my involvement is a guarantor, or, or will guarantee a certain quality level, which I find absurd, but that's okay. Again, like, make them fire you instead of quitting. We do it for the money, so if they're gonna pay me, I'll do that. But I really do it because um, it's working with writers that I, I just adore and who are just great writers. And um, The Americans is a show that's uh, going to come on in F on FX in January um, about KGB spies in America in 1981 with Kerry Russell and Matthew Reese and uh, Noah Emmerich. And it's written by this guy Joe Weisberg, who is someone that CAA introduced me to, Joe Cohen, um, several years ago. And he had an idea for a TV series about a CIA station overseas, and I just, you know, helped him as much as I could, just giving him some story advice and whatever. And, uh, you know, we've just become really good friends, and he's just a spectacular writer. So when he came up with the idea of the Americans, I, you know, he said, do you want to be part of this? And I said, I I'd love to. Um, and really my job on that one is saying, isn't Joe a brilliant writer? Because I, there's almost, I I'll give him notes, you know, that's my job, but um, he's just fantastic. And then the, the thing at Fox with Taylor Elmore is similar in that I just love Taylor's writing, so it's fun to work with him. Yeah, I mean, so it's sort of like a glorified cheerleader, but in a, in a really, like, positive way where you're, you're really helping somebody do something you did a while back. You know, you paid the way for them. Um, now, the Americans, Joe Weis Weisberg. Did he used to be in the, the CIA? Yes, he was in the CIA. We, we have a certain theory that, in fact, he does no writing at all. There's a team at Langley <laughs> in the basement churning right. out these scripts. Yeah. 
he, uh, there, was a, there was an article, uh, a, a small piece on him in the New York Times, and the Times called, have you heard this called the CIA? To say, and they said, we can neither confirm nor, nor deny. <laughs> and but, and the, the person kept on sort of pestering, and finally the CIA person said, look, if he wasn't, if he hadn't been in the CIA, we would somehow let you know. And that was it, click. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like what writers do when they try to confirm whether a movie yes. is uh, starting or not. Like, is Joss Whedon going to direct and write Avengers 2? Um, maybe. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Um, so now, the, the, so with the Americans, did you like want to do it with FX? Did you pitch it to them specifically because you've worked with um, um, we, I mean, we, we, you know, Joe pitched it to a bunch of places. We did the whole, the whole dog and pony show and took it around. Um, like, is it something that should be on cable versus? Uh, well, I, I think the best version probably is on FX, maybe HBO or Showtime. But, um, you know, the, the 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 people at HBO and Showtime, the people, they're all a lot of smart people, frankly, and they're doing the best they can. But the the, the team at FX is spectacular. John Landgraf is, you yeah. know. The, one of the smartest guys in the business and just has a great story sense and um, he's really fun to work with and work for. Um, so it was, you know, I, I, when we were pitching Justified, at that point it was just called Untitled Elmore Leonard, Pro Elmore Leonard Project. We took it all the way around, eight places, and FX was one of the last places we went to. And at the end of the pitch, John, I mean, John was asking all these questions and offering up ideas. I said, John, I wish we'd come here first, because I would have stolen all of that that you just <laughs> gave me. And then, yeah, anyway. Uh, how much uh, input does FX give you in terms of, like, you know, what drugs you can use on the show, on, on Justified? Well, we have a lot of drug product placements. Um, you know, for a while the Meth Council was sponsoring us, but then they, right. they really kind of went big and breaking bad, so we, Oxy, you know, gave us sure. some money. Um, no, it's, it's basic cable, you know, we can say shit but not fuck. We can show <laughs> back nudity but not front nudity, and, you know, that's kind of it. Okay. Um, you don't get a lot You know lot what? Of they don't want a lot of goddamns, I'll tell you that. Especially mm. with Justified, because it is, um, it plays you know, all across the land and has a good audience in, in states where um, that kind of um, profanity is not appreciated. They don't mind the shits. So if that's written in there, do you, what do you switch it to? Like, would you say like... Gold darn, no, you just kind of take it out and you get a couple per episode. Um, how concerned with, um, you know, authenticity about Kentucky have you, are, are you really sensitive to that? Have you gotten emails from people from Eastern Kentucky saying, this is nothing like where I'm from? Um, you know, I, I think it's a little bit like people on a smaller scale, but people in New Jersey in the years of The Sopranos, which is maybe we should be offended, but this is fun. And um, we've, we've, between the first and second season, a group of us went down to Lexington and then on down to Harlan. And um, you know, we met with Chamber of Commerce people, so of course they're going to say nice things. And we were hearing a lot of nice things. Oh, I really like the show. But we were checking into the Holiday Inn Express in Harlan, and there was this young woman behind the counter, and she was just taking forever. And she was, oh, and finally, I, it was my turn. I came up, and I was last, and I said, uh, you know, are you okay? And she said, no, I was out in the sun yesterday too much, and I think I'm sick and stuff. Going, what are you guys here for? And I said, oh, we do a TV series uh, called Justified. And her eyes just lit up. She says, oh, I love that show. And this guy, this old codger, by which I mean he was my age, came out from, <laughs> from behind the counter and said, oh, that's the best movie on TV. And, uh, <laughs> and we've, we've heard a lot of that, that you know, people in Harlan really enjoy the show. Um, now, that said, they were not happy when we killed off Mags Bennett at the end of season two. And Fred Golan and I are afraid for our lives if we ever went back to Harlan. They love Mags. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a, they, they do give us a lot of feedback. Like, you'd be talking to them and they'd, they'd say, oh, that, that character in that, that episode, I know that guy. Um, and it's really out of our imagination, but it also comes out of research. And so every year since, at least a couple writers have gone down and explored certain ideas, you know. And yeah, maybe this year it would be fun to do something with a um, you know, a real backwoods snake handling church. <laughs> um, and so that will play a part in the first four episodes. 
And so they went to a church. Uh, the wow. minister didn't feel called that night to pull out the snakes, but there they were in the boxes, right, you know, on the side of the, the church. Um, and, you know, other things that come up and characters. And so it's that level of authentic, the language. Someone complimented us on the fact that we've never had anyone say y'all. Um, That's you know, and I understand yeah. that as a Canadian, if I hear people talking Canadian, eh? I was like, shut up. <laughs> yeah. hey. Anyway. And with that, um, speaking of uh, mags, um, we're going to open the floor up to um, questions. And whoever asks the best question, in his opinion, oh, at great. the end of it. No, it's got to be your opinion. OK, my opinion. Wins this justified jar. Um, mags Bennett's Emmy winning apple pie. Right here. So, do we have it was uh, any in questions? The jar, not in the glass. Yes. How you doing? Good. All right. My name is uh, Donnie Leapard. I have a drama pilot in the festival called Osiris, and uh, we, a lot of us here, have pilots in the festival, and we don't get an opportunity to speak to someone with your kind of resume and successful experience in the industry. So I wanted to ask a question, a two-part question actually, but I need you to be brutally honest with no sugar-coated, inspirational kind of... I, you, did you miss the part where I said I'm Canadian? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So first thing is, a lot of us, I've been meeting everybody, um, a lot of people um, who have pilots in the festival since I've been here, and there are people from everywhere all across the country. Uh, but when we hear um, talks from successful producers and executive producers like yourself, there's a, a trend in the story that you have a long career in Los Angeles filled with highs and lows. So first part, do all of us need to move to Los Angeles to really see some, some kind of success? The second thing, the second question is, a lot of us have pilots here, we're all excited to get deals, to get, you know, talk to some executives. But uh, the question is, is how likely is it with, with for people like us without the long resumes to really maintain creative control to people like you said, you were godfather to another show. If we were to be godfathered by another uh, producer, EP with a, you know, a bigger resume, they start to say, well, I think we should go this direction, that direction. We don't have the same resume, so we won't be able to say that's not a good idea. So is it a situation where we might be better off at a smaller network with more control or a bigger network with more exposure? So that's it. I believe you said two questions. Come on, that's like nine questions. No, first of all, should you move to Los Angeles? Traffic is bad enough, no. Um, no, I mean, Liz, I would always say to people, you know, if you wanna be in country music, you've gotta to go to Nashville. And uh, for a time, maybe not forever, but I think that that's where most of the television is produced. Um, you know, I got, listen, I got a little bit of work with Nickelodeon when I was here, but I ended up getting a lot more work in Los Angeles. And that was also partly a function of age. I was just, you know, just starting out when I was here, and I was just a little bit older in LA. Um, in terms of, you know, creative control and stuff, I mean, the reason I quit Full House is because they didn't want to do my in-depth thing about childhood obesity. And uh, no, it was just, my, none of my jokes were landing. Um, I, listen, I'm, I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm a pretty pragmatic guy. My goal was to be um, a, a working writer. And my goal in terms of trying to have success in this business is because success allows me to keep doing it. Um, there are things that I have you know, a creative vision on, um, and some of those may come to pass some days or not. Boomtown was certainly one of those. Most of the other things on my resume are things where I've been working pretty closely with other people, and the vision is shared. So, um, you know, you said don't sugarcoat it. If you want to have just your vision and your vision alone, become a painter or become a novelist. But television and film is, is collaborative, and you're working with actors, and you're working with, in the case of a TV series, other writers and directors. Um, a studio, a network, uh, there's a lot of people that are going to have input. Um, and it's important to have that sort of, you know, this way kind of thing. We're, this is where we're headed. Um, 
and I'll say, the first year of a television show, we're all very lucky to ever get a first year of any show, but it, that's really tough because no one's quite sure what it's going to be yet and everyone's got their opinion. Um, we were lucky on Boomtown because they didn't really know what the show was, so we got, kind of got left alone. Uh, with Justified, there were a lot of notes the first year. Should, should that comma really go there? It's like, oh, God, no, please. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that bad for the writing, but um, it had its moments. You see, I answered about three out of the nine. Hi. Um, I'm just a freshman in college, so, and I'm pursuing film, so I'm just starting into all of this stuff. And um, I was wondering, at like the start of your career and like towards the beginning, what kind of opportunities did you turn down, if any? And like, how did you know to, like, what what to pursue and what not to? Because that's I, I don't know. Just I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I mean that's interesting. I. It's funny. I, it'll probably hit me walking back to the hotel. Oh yeah, I turned down that thing or, or this thing. But I really have kind of taken any. Well, at a certain point, took anything that came along. I wrote a pamphlet about home care for people with <laughs> catheters sticking out of their chests. It wasn't that wasn't my dream. <laughs> Someday, mommy, I'll write that. Um, but it was. Um, I mean, really, I would I would write anything if and if I got a shot at a. TV series, or a I would just go. But I think that, you know, in terms of what I wrote on my own, I was always working on the things that I wanted to see. Um, you know, we've got a limited amount of experience in our lives. You know, I've never been a ship's captain or whatever, but man, I'd love to see a, a great television show set on an aircraft carrier, and that's what Taylor Elmore is writing. But so that's, you know, becomes a passion, or the Apollo space program, or whatever. Um, but your question was about really kind of choosing. Um, and I think a lot of it is just taking work where you can get it, because I think the mistake that you can make is thinking that you can't learn from every experience, and you can. No matter how bad it is, you can, there's something to learn. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, in 50 years, they're just going to be sort of, you know, digits stored on some medium that hasn't been invented yet, the only thing that I take away with it is the experiences I had working with those people. When I think of Boomtown, I'm very proud of what we did, but it's really, I think, of the working with the writers and the actors and the directors, and even Justified now, it's, it's you know, I'm very proud of the show, but the thing that I'll come home and tell my wife about is our writer Chris Provenzano coining the phrase when one of our writers was having a second helping of ribs and couldn't stop pitching. He was just like frantic, and Chris said, oh my God, he's got the meat crazies. And just that <laughs> term, the meat crazies, that has made me laugh for a week. So um, that's fantastic. I get paid to hang in a room with those guys. Anyway, long answer to that. Have you been reading my email? Um, because, no, it's interesting. I mean, the one thing that we didn't talk, I, I, I sold a pilot idea to NBC, and I haven't even talked about this with Adam, but um, it's a slightly off thing for NBC right now. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crime show, but it's set in 1971, and it's got a female protagonist who goes undercover. And, um, you know, the studio, when they heard it was period, didn't want to hear it but they had to hear it because they've got to deal with me. And they're like, oh, God, we like this. Similarly, kind of at the network, it was like, oh, really, we don't want to buy this, but oh, we like it. But a lot of it was also because of my relationships with the studio and the network. So I may actually roll this thing over, what we haven't talked about. I've talked about it with Sun. Roll it over to next year because you asked, how, when can you get too busy? And I'm right at that point. And for that thing to fly, for it to get filmed as a pilot and make it to series, I can't turn in a good script. I've got to turn in a great script. And the only thing that would maybe let me turn in a very good script and still get it shot would be if I attached a really strong director or, or a big piece of talent. So um, I've got a certain amount of juice, but I don't have as much juice as a lot of you know, the, the, the really big shot showrunners. Um, 
And you know, Justified has done well, but you know, I, I saw Alex Gans at a showrunner's thing uh, last week, and he's one of the showrunners on Homeland. He's already, he, was ta he looked taller. I mean, it's just like he has grown in stature somehow. Um, great guy, by the way. But, um, you know, so I've, I've got a certain amount, and I have, but it's, you're absolutely right. It's a calculation. How much can I, and then if they buy the script, but they're not, mm, chances they're not going to make it, well, then why write it? You know, so, um, but then, you know, the other thing is, is that because of Justified, and frankly, this is, this is all because of Justified with, with a uh, sort of supported by the other stuff. But really what counts right now is Justified, that it's, it's well regarded in the business in, in Los Angeles particularly, um, is what might happen is people might come to me with things. And they might come to me with a piece of talent, um, which just sounds, a piece of talent. It's just a piece <laughs> of talent. Anyway, um, <laughs> but, you know, or a property. And, um, so that, that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, we have one more time for one more question. I know. You, we could go for four uh, hours. I know. No, we, got, we have one right. Uh, she was actually sure. Aw. What a gentleman. Wow. Then oh, you he wins this. Too. He totally wins this. You win the jar. No question, but you win the jar. Thank you so much. Um, I'm in uh, children's uh, original programming and development, but I want to move over to more adult programming, and I want you to talk about your transition from going from basically doing the same and the role that your manager and agent played in that and when you actually got a manager and agent, like where in, where in your career that happened? Um, you know, I got, a, I got an agent, small boutique agency when I first moved to LA and it was one of those weird serendipitous things. It just someone had sent my script to someone and they read it. And, um, but, you know, a lot of the jobs I've gotten, I've gotten just on my own. Um, but that transition from like hey dude into full house that sort of made sense although my specs were roseanne and murphy brown i was shooting for a more grown-up show um but the big thing was then i wrote speed and it, one of the great things about being a writer is if we want to reinvent ourselves we just write something so there's a writer on our show this year and she actually started last year ingrid escajeda and she had been in half hour for years, and she would, uh, was one of the writer. It was a writer on Better Off Ted, and she uh, decided she wanted to be an hour long. So she wrote a spec original pilot called it, about a bomb squad, and the title alone I just loved. It was Left of Boom, and that's a bomb squad term. That's everything that happens up before the thing goes off, and after that it's right of boom. Um, so, and it was just a really strong pilot, and that's how she made the transition. In, in turn, I've never had a manager. Um, CAA is the best agency that ever could exist and ever will exist, and so there would be no need to have a manager. Um, and they are better than cats. Um, a few people still get that joke, but anyway. Um, but, you know, Sonia has been incredibly, Sonia Rosenfeld is my TV agent, uh, has been incredibly helpful in terms of guiding and saying, well, that feels more right for this or for that. Um, and they can play a big role. Um, it's, it's really, you know, obviously that's the first big hurdle in this business. Is that it? I mean, I want more. <laughs> but uh, I think we're being booted off the stage off so the we stage. can see this amazing thing that's coming up next, yes. which is the comedy I'm writers. Say, I'm gonna sit in the back. Yeah. Um, before we go, I just want to say that I actually like Broken Arrow. Oh, that's very sweet of you. <laughs> okay. Give it up for Graham Yost. Oh, thanks.